We are very lucky to have Grant Henry from Stemage and Metroid Metal here to join our discussion about music and games. Grant, you are obviously deeply entrenched in the video games and music industry. Uh, so can you tell our listeners a little bit about what you do, both directly in actual games and tangentially for other entertainment? Because some people may not have heard of the famous Grant Henry before, so let them know what you do, man. Well, if they haven't heard of me, it's because I'm not that famous, Scott. Uh, you got a Wikipedia that's, that's page. The truth. I, I do I do have a Wikipedia page, page, that's true. So I guess that's good enough to get on a podcast and talk about. Uh, but no, I... <laughs> I've I my whole thing uh, I've been band hopping forever, but I got into this video game remix stuff. I started the Metroid Metal Project back in two thousand three, and, and Scott, that's how we obviously we got in touch and, and kept up. Twenty one years um, ago, twenty 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 yeah, almost twenty one years ago. Which is <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so yeah, Real so I, drinking age. Let me tell. You, oh yeah, my project can drink now. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, so yeah, so so and then I just uh, ended up. I think what's happened a lot in, in the video game remix scene is if the, the people that have been doing it for a really long time, you just people have sort of segued into doing actual music for games. They're obviously inspired by a lot of the, those that type those types of music. Um, they've, their, their production chops have gotten better, and they've just slid into indie games doing things. Uh, I started getting hired to do some session guitar work. Um, I did some work on Steven Universe. I was I did some work on Rogue Legacy, like little like projects where I was just starting to get work. And so I ended up going all in. Uh, I was doing like web work and decided to just switch over and try to do music full time. And it's actually working. So I am, I am a full time composer, sound designer, session guitar person uh, working on a number of indie games and some TV and some film stuff. So I've, you know, it's all mostly indie stuff. The biggest game I've probably done is is the one that is it's called Hextech Mayhem. It was a it's a League of Legends spinoff for um, the champion named Ziggs. He's this little yordle cat dude that throws bombs. <laughs> Had to write him a theme song, uh, and we'd made this musical rhythm platformer game. I worked on the latest Bubsy game. I worked on a game with Zach Gage called Card of Darkness. Uh, I worked on the I did a track for the most recent Rogue Legacy. Um, and I've started doing and, and and guitar in a number of games. I did uh, uh, I did the guitar and the theme song for Chia, which came out last year. Oh wow! Uh, so I just I didn't doing know a, that. <laughs> I yeah, pl I played yeah. that game. It's my acoustic and the and the yeah. theme of that of that game. So I so I've just made a, a lot of buddies and, and gotten in with people that have that are that are doing this and um and keep doing it. And I'm, and I'm, and I just finished I finished a short film last year. Um, so I'm doing lots of. Just tangent, and I did like some th music for the Devolver Digital E3 showcases. Mm -hmm. So I've done like stuff for games, and then stuff on the side of games uh, for a while now, and, and I'm, I'm continuing to do it. So well, it sounds like it's good. Great. Time. You're still incredibly cool. Well, oh, you're incredible. Well, thank you, and you're incredibly. He's cool. effortlessly cool. I very always nice. say very nice. Well, but uh, that's hey, true I'll as well. It. So I guess that means guitar, right? Is your your instrument of choice then, right? It is, yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of. It's really funny because a lot of the music that I've done that doesn't have any guitar in it was definitely written on guitar. I have like a, a audio plugin where I can plug my guitar through it, and it will hear my guitar, dry guitar, and it will interpolate it and turn it into MIDI data. Uh -huh. So it will turn it into the data that you use to control these other instruments and synths and stuff. So, or an or or, or an orchestral uh, plugin. So. You know, when, you, when you're when you playing guitar, but you're hearing a choir come out through your headphones, it changes the way you play guitar. But I don't know how to play piano. I don't know how to read music. So guitar is what I know. So even if you hear music I make that doesn't sound like it has guitar in it, it was written on guitar, mostly. That's amazing. Um, I did not okay. know that. <laughs> yeah. That actually piqued my interest wild. when you said you can't read music. Yeah, it's true. You know, I wondered I if I can't read would... music either. Can you not? No. Um, I always, I was, I'm not as cool as you. Uh, I can't play an instrument, but I was in choir from kindergarten through twelfth grade, and I can never read the music. I had to listen by ear to sing. You don't. Ha you don't have to yeah. put yourself down every time before you ask Grant a question. <laughs> no, you... I'm just saying. Like he's so cool that I can't help but say I'm not as cool because. I well, can't... you realize we both can't read music, so you're as cool as me in that, in that regard. <laughs> nah, yeah. no. All right. I, yeah, no, I, I actually it's, wondered. It's blanketly implied we're all not as cool as Grant, okay? <laughs> I can read music, and I... I'm still not as cool as Grant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wondered if that would be a problem, 
going forward, going, getting, start, starting to work with other people, not being able to like read sheets or make sheets or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it hasn't. And I, and I, and I met a lot of composers that don't know how to read music. Some like big shot people that write for TV and things, and they don't know how to read music either. And it ends up being okay either because you can take the music you've made and turn them into sheets for other people. Or you can say, I don't want sheet music. Send me MIDI. Send me send me data to, to learn instead. So it ends it's ended up being okay. But you'd be su- surprised the amount of music and games you've probably heard that are written by people that just learn by ear. Like they just they've learned. I've I've always thought of myself as more of a songwriter than a like a composer. But that's just the words you use. But that's mm-hmm. you know I came out of. I learned a bunch of Guns N' Roses songs on guitar, and, and here I am. I didn't come from class piano or playing in, in um, you know, playing in band and in, in high school or anything like that. Um, so it's just sort of where I came from. But yeah, tried to try to take class piano in college and would learn the song enough to just memorize it, and then want to like mess around instead of reading. I had to pretend to read the music, you know, in class. <laughs> yeah, so, I did that as well. I pretended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to pretty pretend to look up, but you're really, you know, you, but that's just how it is. But it hasn't really been a problem for me. That's, so that's really good. awesome. It is awesome. And I got to tell everybody that if you're listening, like Grant mentioned, the way that I discovered him 21 years ago was Metroid Metal. I don't even remember. I just stumbled across your site or something. I don't know how I found you, but I bought your CD. I bought your T-shirt. Um, I, that, that T-shirt finally bit the dust. Um, I yeah. had, I had one of the OGs, like it was like a strip across the front with the MM symbol. And then yep. on the back, it had the, the Metroid with the, wearing the headphones. I used to listen to that thing. And in fact, I know this is for audio only listeners. This is not going to be cool, but I actually have the original. Oh, that's awesome. CD. Oh, there it is. It's got like this hand drawn autograph on the front of it. And yeah. Look at that. Um, yeah, when, uh, I met you in person for the first time, up in Minneapolis at the video game music convention. It was like right yep. before COVID hit. Do you remember that? Yep. And absolutely, uh, yeah. I brought that with me and I got to like, like I said, meet him for the first time. I had him sign my copy of this, this 21 year old, you know, it's, it's like burned. It's not like, you know, mass produced or anything. It's got one of the, Oh no. The labels on it that like you, you could buy those, those things at, at, you know, oh, Best yeah, Buy or whatever. TDR logo. Yeah, and you print on it and put it in there. It's got a little like I don't know. It's just it just was that a picture? A, is that a drawing of Samus's ship on the disc? No, on the, it's actually a picture of uh, Samus. Oh, Samus! Um, throwing yeah. horns. Okay, rocking out. Yeah, gotcha. okay. yeah throwing the horns. horns. Yeah, and then on I the, love it. And then on the inside uh, over here, there's some other like Metroids all over the place. Oh, you rock, Scott. Yeah, yeah. It was nice of him to lie to you on a CD. Right? I know. I know. <laughs> You know, it's like you don't have to put me down every time we talk about how cool Grant is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you can check out Metroid Metal and the rest of his music under Stemage, S-T-E-M-A-G-E. He's got his website, of course, uh, but uh, I mean, he's on Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, all that good stuff. Wherever you listen to music, you can probably check out. And the Metroid stuff is just amazing. It's so good. Um, I think... I approached you originally, if you remember, because I wanted to make like a promo for the Gaming Outsider. That was when I first reached out yep. to you. Uh, I, I asked your permission to use your Marble Madness cover that you yes. did. I can't remember what you what what you called the song, um, but I wanted to use it in like just like this thirty second promo. And you responded like within an hour, and were like, mm. I, "I I missed this. This is, of course you can use it." And then that just developed into like this friendship that we've got today, and it's it's awesome. Yep. So. Yeah, um, if anyone likes Marble Madness, listen to my "Where Good Marbles Go to Die" album. Yes, that's, uh, <laughs> okay, that was a fun a cool one to title. do. That was a fun one. Yeah, good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Well, Grant, we have some questions for you about what you do. I, I posted on social media and asked everybody to have some questions to ask you about what it takes to make music for video games and and all this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be direct with you. Most of them are Kevin. Uh, he's, That's fine. He's he's got a lot a lot of questions. Uh, Kevin is That's my great. it's our producer, obviously, but he's also my my concert buddy. We have be, we've started going to concerts. We're actually going to one tomorrow night. Uh, awesome. So, uh, but uh, we'll we'll start with the other ones first. So, Zach, why don't you kick things off with Mark's question for Grant? Sure. Mark Zamansky writes in: Are you given the premise storyboards for the game so that you can start building ideas, or are you given gameplay videos to design the music around? That's a good question. 
That is a good question. I mean, it really depends. I think it has to, a lot of it has to do with how much the music uh, is tied to the game. You know, if you're making like a musical game, sometimes you're going to be making art or you're going to be making movement or the gameplay is going to be tied to the music. But if you're just trying to like, if someone needs music for a scene, the scene has some art associated, something to give you an idea of the vibe, then you get something. You, you normally at least get some sketches or... Um, some some art just some mood art to try and and uh so you can get something down there's an interesting story when i was doing the music for card of darkness which is a uh kind of a run based card game for ios uh, for apple arcade by zach gage he showed the the art was done by pendleton ward who did adventure time Oh, okay. And the the music or the, the the artwork is very cartoony. You know, our Adventure Time looks like mm-hmm. it looks like that. It's very cute, very cartoony. So he started. So I started working on some level music, and he was like, "This is too. This is too happy. This is so. We want this way darker because this game is mean. This game is hard. Like the the art is deceptive. Say, the idea is that because like you, 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 the key art is like of a rainbow in the background, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, exactly. It's like a really cute bumblebee, you know, yeah. and or a really cute flower, and this sort of chibi looking little dude with this with a with like a, a you know with like a, a giant pot. He's wielding a pot versus his weapon and a backpack, and so. But it turns out this game is rough. This game is dark. This game wants you to concentrate. And so that is what he wanted the music to, to, to reflect. So we went through revisions of the music. We started happy. And then I sort of went from there. I did a revision of that that was a little darker. And a revision of that went from major to minor. A revision of that that was a little darker. And then we, then we found the vibe. And we ended up something that was, was a little... He was a big fan of the Secret of Mana soundtrack, which is just an all-time great soundtrack. Um, and so we ended up with music that was much more moody, much more dark uh, than planned. So I really needed more than just the art to to find the right sound for this game. And we got there, but it took some work to get there. So, mm. you know, it's nice to get just some art or just some sketches or assets, but you really need to like, whoever's working on the game, it really involves like a conversation to, to, to figure out what is needed and you eventually get there you hope you get there um but it can take some work to find the sound uh for something like that but yeah you get something most of the time you get something unless it's super early and you're just trying to get the gig where you need to write like 30 seconds of music just to prove that you know what you're doing Mm. um normally if if you're in a part of the project you're going to get something to work with but what you get can vary i kind of want to like two things i want to be a fly on the wall for those conversations just because that sounds like a fascinating thing to hear and yeah. number two it's got to be so bizarre doing it from their perspective where all they're giving you is a tone that they want yes. you know what i mean or like yes. like a, this is the vibe we want for this and then sitting and waiting and all of a sudden you produce this music and like what would that experience be like to have not heard they didn't hear the process of you writing it as you did you know what i mean like whether it be in yeah. your head or on paper or then actually with your instruments but then to like you know piece it together piece by piece and put this track together and kind of grow up with this track as it becomes from infancy to whatever it is but he just gets it <laughs> you know what i mean like, like yeah. that's just got to be such an interesting experience to like Let's see what the let's see what the composer comes up with for the song, and then, you know, how honest are they with you? Yeah, and I think like um, a different. Some people are better at describing what they want in music than others, and you don't necessarily need to be a musician to explain that kind of stuff. You might just be really good at just try at, at explaining the vibe you're looking for. Someone might say something like, "Oh gosh, this." It needs to sound more. It needs to. Some people will say it needs. To, it sounds too dark, but you don't know what dark means. Does dark mean sonically? It's too dark. There's not enough brightness in it, or is it musically? It needs to sound brighter. You never really know. But someone might be like, you know, it sounds a little too much like this. Could you make it sound more like this? And they talk about they're, they're naming composers, mm. and then you can go, oh, okay, I, I see what he means. It sounds a little like this composer, but he wants it to sound a little more like this. Then you can try and like make it work. Um, but I don't know when, when people, it all depends on who you're talking to. Uh, it's really funny. Sometimes when musicians are giving you feedback, it's too specific. Mm. Uh, and it's almost easier to get 
feedback from non-musicians because they're talking about how they're feeling. Right. They're not talking about specific instruments or EQ or, inst- you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, it can be, I don't know, the feedback process, the back and forth can be easy, but it can, it, it, but it can also be really, really hard. It just depends. But, so yeah, I sh- I should send you. I should send, sorry, to, uh, but I should. I have the I have the MP3s of the the song was too happy, and then where we ended up. I should send you that. I, I think it's like four songs, uh, so you can hear what it sounded like. I like would the, love to hear that. It's too happy, and then here we finally landed on it. I'll have to send. I'll have to send those to you so you can listen to them. Yeah, that'd be a, uh, that'd be. An, can you like put that like in a somewhere. YouTube video or something? Like I, I should do that. Yeah, I'll throw you the MP3s for them. You could. I mean. You could, you can put them in here if you wanted to. I mean, I'd love to listen to them too. So yeah, yeah I'll send you. I'll send you links to those. All right, cool. But, yeah. We'll put we'll put Kevin to work. Ask him to do it. <laughs> there you go, Kevin. <laughs> so, but with like hex tech because it's so rhythm based, are you were you in on the ground floor for that then or yeah? Because they would almost have yes. to build levels around your music, right? That's exactly right. So for hex tech, a couple things. One, Riot Games is very much a music studio as as much as as a league of legends studio so they make they produce they create these artists these 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 pretend virtual artists and make albums and songs for them oh, so they make music okay. in-house all the time so and there's music videos there's been it was a music video for jinx you, you know years ago to like for her her theme song well our little character ziggs didn't have a theme song so we're like crap well, we gotta make we gotta find the zig sound and so he's this like little yordle that builds bombs in it with duct tape in his garage he's sort of unhinged right. what does that sound like so we ended up sort of like in the crash bandicoot era ps1 vibe with the music and then wanted to have all these like tinkering noises too so there's a lot of clockwork that plays yep. in key like a lot of tinks and sort of mechanical stuff that would sound like maybe him in his garage building bombs so we made him a theme song and then from there we were making these game these levels that where we wanted every jump to be a kick drum and every slam to be a snare drum. Oh. Bump, jump, bump, bump, jump. So I had to go through and like write a song, and then I would ex- take the data of that song and we'd import it into the engine for the for our, our programmer to actually make a level to, to, to have him move with the music. And he would come back and go, hey, this fill does not work. Like, dude can't move to fit this drum beat so i would edit it to, to make it fit the drum beat so it was literally like a back and forth between me and the level designers to to find out what we needed for the mute on the music side and the, and the gameplay side to like make levels that work so just to be like uh, uh oh so on bar 74 uh there's too many beats in this drum fill can you can you you know simplify that one like is it that it's like that he would basic what he basically would do is he would he would make a level and then he would get as close as he could, and then he would highlight a couple spots where he had to do something different. Hmm. And so I would just go and change the drums to whatever he did, and then finish ah. the song. And then finish the song over it. It was all percussion based, right? Like Very. everything that all his movement. Um, but yeah, it was definitely ground floor because it, the, you know you're locking his movement to the music. We had to. I had to be there from the beginning to make that work. That's fascinating. That was hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, dude, it was I bet. really. It was rough. Um, so yeah. Sometimes it, it's, but I don't always have to be there from the beginning. But when it's we're talking about rhythm, a rhythm platformer, definitely from the from yeah. the beginning. All right, Alyssa, you want to take the next question? Sure. Sean Coates asks: Did you ever work on projects where you had to factor in or make considerations for any hardware limitations? If so, how did it affect the way you approached your compositions? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think like. The most recent game that we that I worked on, Bitrip Rerunner, uh, it, it's a game where you it, it it's a uh, you a song will play, and then as you mode up, as you collect power ups, the the music will switch to a different layer. So there's five layers of music sort of playing at the same time, and then in memory, like amplitude right? style, like amplitude, very very similar to that. And then on, in addition to that, you're collecting everything you interact with, everything you hit, everything you jump over is all playing from these batches of sounds that all play in time with the music. So everything, and, and, and you know, depending on the chord of, the, of that part of the song, it will play a different collection of sounds because it'll be in a different key. So all the sounds have to be in key with the music, which means all that stuff has to be in memory, ready to fire too. So... When you start talking about hardware limitations, when, when you're when you're doing all this stuff in time, 
CPU is very, very a, a thing that we have to pay attention to. Like we have to make sure that we're not squeezing the system so much uh, to make things fire in time that it causes any lag. Mm -hmm. If you have a lag in a rhythm platformer, it ruins the game. Like start oh, yeah. skipping frames, it, dest it either destroys the gameplay or it destroys the audio, right? So we have to make sure that works. Um, and then in addition, when we're loading all this stuff in memory, it takes up memory. It takes up memory. So we have to know, we have to make sure to optimize to make sure that works as well. So that was a really good example of one of those things where I couldn't just do whatever I wanted and have everything loaded into memory ahead of time because it just was going to bog the system down. So so to answer your question, yeah. If, and if you're playing, if you're not doing something like that where everything has to fire in time, I think you have a bit more, of, a bit more leeway. Like stuff can kind of come and go, but when you need to have all this audio armed, like ready to fire at any moment, depending on what you do, then you definitely got to worry about hardware. You got to you have to do stuff specific to PC. You got to do stuff specific to Xbox and PS5. And Switch is a an eight year old mobile phone, so like you know it just depends. But yeah, it 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 it's definitely something you have to pay attention to. You have to go through optimization for audio, just like you do for like. Uh, you know the games that are getting fixed after launch all the frame skipping and buffering and crap you see with graphics you have to do all that stuff with audio as well oh, um yeah. i just don't think you notice it as much when games launch because the audio mm -hmm. stuff's a bit easier to, to to figure out than the the graphics stuff gotcha i'm just i'm just rambling now does this make sense hey, it's making sense dude yeah okay, it's good. fascinating yeah good very cool. Well, uh, here we go, man. <laughs> I've got <laughs> I've got the onslaught of questions from Kevin. He actually started and said, uh, uh, "How many questions am I allowed to ask?" Um, Kevin, I look. Kevin is awesome. Kevin is like the go cast unsung hero. Seriously. He's sung, but Kevin's a hero. Kevin is like killer producer. He's doing all this like social stuff. He's great. I oh, love yeah. Kevin. So ask as he many questions as you good. want. That's right. Yeah. So go nuts. Uh, so his first question says, do you go through some sort of agency or something, or do studios just find you somehow and say, hey, we need music stuff for our Shooty Shooty Bang Bang? Hello, the, agency, the agency I work with is called Shooty Shooty Bang Bang. No, no that's not true. What a coincidence. <laughs> no, I don't have an agent or anything. I'm just, I'm absolutely 100% freelance guy. Um, a lot of the gigs I get are just because people have worked with me before and they might, I might get, a, they, I might be recommended to someone. Um so they do, they just, they, I, I, at this point, I'm getting enough gigs and I have enough regular things that I haven't had to like, you know, cold call as much, you know, posts looking for audio. I haven't, it's been more like there, I knew there was an opportunity and so I would either re reach out to someone or someone reached out to me. And um, I'm trying to do le uh, uh, fewer larger projects instead of a ton of tiny things mm. just because, you know, it's easier that way. Um, but yeah, no agency. Just it's just me working with these teams and figuring out what they need and making it work. Well, can I can I ask then because you said Steven Universe and Rogue Legacy was some of your earlier uh, work, you know, freelancing. How how did you mm -hmm. get hooked up with Steven Universe? Because wasn't that kind of a big property when you joined? Yeah, it? Big. it was definitely a big yeah. show. Yeah. during that time. So Rebecca Sugar, the creator of Steven Universe, uh, really enjoyed uh, this duo's uh, uh, now husband and wife uh, couple. Ivy and Sarashu loved their music they had done on their, she does mostly piano and he does mostly chip stuff and really enjoyed their original album they made. So I reached out to them thinking they'd be a good fit for her show. And then when they learned, when they had a drummer that they were using regularly and we were all sort of friends, but then they, they, there was a need for a guitar. And I remember it very specifically Ivy saying, oh, I just thought Grant did all the like loud guitar stuff, like the heavy stuff i didn't know he had an acoustic i'm like i got a bunch of acoustics they're right they're right here so they brought me in to do some acoustic for a song and then fast forward i and i did pretty much all the guitar for the show and whenever greg was playing acoustic on on screen that's me playing those Whoa, guys really? playing yeah I watch playing Steven the Universe acoustic now. Greg, greg is the rocker bro Dude, let me tell you, the first time I saw Gre Greg, a cartoon on screen playing the guitar I recorded, like it was the most surreal that's thing crazy. in the world. That's absolutely crazy. Um, I know. I so know yeah, so Greg's I just became, guitar. Yeah, personally. Greg, yeah. Greg playing the playing the grandpa guitar. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I just sort of stayed on that, and then um, it, and and wor did all five seasons with them, and then the, the movie happened, and I actually got to arrange a song uh, for the movie, and then I did some a little bit of guitar for the Steven Universe future. Um, show as well so it was just because i had known them in the video game music remix stuff and you know it was just a 
sort of uh, already knew they knew me. We'd done little things together, and then when it was time to look for guitar, they they decided to reach out. Wow! So, so really, yeah. is who you know. It really is who you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Wow. But uh, Kevin, Kevin's next question here. Do you just record MP3 or wave tracks and send them to them, or do you have to do anything special since they're going into a video game format? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, it's uh, always waves, and it, the the format of the wave just this is a great because Kevin's dealing with like sample rates and sure. audio formats all the time. So um, it's always waves. It it uh, the the format of the wave just depends on the engine. And sometimes I'm just writing music and, and doing as they say, throwing it over the fence, like it's just music and they put it in the game. Mm-hmm. Or uh, for the case of the stuff I've done for Choice Provisions, I use, they use like audio middleware. I use, I like FMOD. That's what I, you've heard FMOD or WISE. You boot up a game and you see FMOD or you see WISE, yeah. right? You see WISE for the expensive games, you see FMOD for the indie game. Oh, <laughs> That's okay. mostly always the case. So FMOD is kind of like a, it's just a piece of software that, um, Allows you to set up all the audio like you want. And then you tell the programmers, hey, these are the names of the calls for this audio. Stick them in the game. They do it. And then you can tweak it at when they're done. So sometimes it's hands-on and sometimes it's just sending wave files to people hmm. and hope for the best. So hmm. Very just interesting. Depends. Kevin's next question is, how do you know what type of feeling a studio is going going for with music do you record a handful of different types and give them to the studio to pick from or did, or do they tell you what type of feel they're going for that's a great question we, we covered a little bit of that when i was talking about the mm-hmm. card of darkness soundtrack but sometimes they don't have any information sometimes they have no idea they're like they're like game designers they don't know music people they're like i don't know what i want like what do you think <laughs> and so you've seen <laughs> sheets of designed logos where like They've made twelve. So a designer's made ten different logos with of different you know feels for a company, and you kind of pick the one you want, and you go from there. Mm-hmm. So sometimes so we call those audio thumbnails. We'll do versions of that too. I might do like twelve seconds of a couple different things just to see where to get started. Um, so that is that's happened a few times. Do you too, reuse those, for, like something you've used in a previous project that didn't get used, and then just like present that to the next company? Yeah, sometimes I've, uh, you know, just grabbed them and put them online as little 20, 30 second samples because I thought they were cute uh, or or neat. And uh, there are a few times I've like used stuff for projects that never happened and reused it for, for something new. I will tell you there, I wrote about 25 minutes of music for a game that will never come out. Oh. Um, the music mm-hmm. is, uh, is, this was several years ago. It's possible I could use that for something else, but it was so specific to the game that it may not ever get used again. But Dude, I can't believe you that, did music also, for scale that also bound. happens. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did it for. Oh, I was going to try to make a joke about a game I can't remember the name of. <laughs> oh, another canceled. <laughs> oh crap! Another canceled. Another thing. Sad yeah, can- anyway. Star Wars thirteen yeah. thirteen, dude. That was you. That's it. That was me. Yeah. Oh, All bummer. in the trash can. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, just like George Lucas wanted. <laughs> uh, yeah. let's see the next question from kevin uh what was your first job involving video game music and how did that come about and how did you feel when it happened my first game music was for an xbox live indie game that is a specific thing for yeah, the 360 mm-hmm. there was an xbox live indie game service a channel where you could like yeah of course, games. that's where i played this um, sweet ass uh, rhythm game called sequence which is like a Turn-based oh. RPG where the 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 music battles were, you know, rhythm arrows. It's kind of like DDR. was it good? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. There were some really good games on there. I think DLC Quest originally came oh, out yeah. on Xbox Live Indies. Um, I did music for a game called Alpha Squad, which was kind of like kind of Contra, mm-hmm. isometric Contra, and I wrote a bunch of rock music for it. And it was the first time I had to, to create seamless loops, you know, where you can't hear the click of music right. starting over. And I wrote like this uh 20 something minute soundtrack for this game i think it was pretty good game was not great game is also va- it's all va- it's vaporized it's gone yeah, forever but the soundtrack is still on my band camp there you go uh, i still i'll still play one of those songs live if i get to play live but uh that was it that was 2010 i think um 10 or 11 something like that but yeah alpha squad shout awesome. out shout out to the gone for, dead and erased xbox live indie games i know i know <laughs> that was 
pretty de- cool service. I miss those days, man. Got it up. Pour one out. That's right. Well, it was a you know it was kind of a fun place. Not to discount the games, but it was a fun place when you had leftover Microsoft points. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. you would yes. just go on there and just find something totally weird. Yep. You know. Isn't that where the I made a game with zombies in it? That was one of the first yeah, it was. Xbox Live Indie games. Was that yeah. with that song? It was, it was like, oh my god! It was like 180 Microsoft. Days. It was like two bucks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. that game had some cool music. It did have some cool that was music. So funny. I miss those old Xbox 360 days though of the online stuff when that was first starting to get its footing. Remember they would do those? Was it like Summer of Arcade or something? Summer where of Arcade. Yeah, yeah. You yep. get like four games and get the fifth one for free. So yeah, like, even yeah. though you didn't were... really want three of those games, it was like, well, I'm not gonna not get that one for free. Right. Well, and most and, of them were pretty good. Yeah. Like there were some really good they summer all, I games. I mean, Braid was yeah. in there. Right. Um, Braid, Braid and Castle Crashers was the same year. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Just, I think uh, Trials. The Trials debut yep. was on the oh, Xbox Live yeah. Indie mm-hmm. game. Oh man, I miss yeah. the Trials games. Me too. Oh, they still, they still they still make them, but they they they, get, they have too much going on now. You know, mm-hmm. I like the simplicity of the early Trials games. Yeah. Uh, but the next question from Kevin here, uh, if you're allowed and comfortable speaking on it, how does compensation work? Do you get royalties? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I don't get, I I don't get any royalties for game sales. I know, I do know of some composers that whenever they were approached to do soundtrack for a, a game, they, they saw that there was super potential there and they said, I will do this soundtrack for free, but I want to get whatever percent of the game sales Ah. Mm -hmm. and for games that are indie games that's really attractive because there's no money up front i know of one specific instance was which i will not name where that's what the guy did and let's just say the game was so massive and has continued to be massive that he bought he made it built a new studio from the proceeds of that wow it was a smart move Mostly, what happens? With Vampire Survivors. <laughs> you know, I don't know who did the music for, for Vampire Survivors, but boy, is that music good! Yes, yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Boy, um, most of the time you're either pay, you're getting paid per per minute of music completed, mm. or you're getting paid like a flat fee. Like you look at the entire project and you go, "I would do it for this much money," or or you do it or you do it, you know, for for a payment after the game is done and so and, and sells for a little bit so you, like you could do it a number of different ways so you literally like give them a um, quote you give them a quote it really and it's rough because it's like it's that thing when you're freelancing where someone asks what's your rate and then you go what's your budget and then you get you get like it's like stalemate it's not really <laughs> stalemate but it's that uncomfortable conversation of like okay you know you want to quote them what you think that your time's worth but you don't want to you don't want it to look too high so that they know there's they think there's no chance or you don't want to be too low you know mm-hmm. they, they say yes we're good then and, and they answer too quick you're like crap i didn't charge enough more. you yeah. know it's hard it's really it's really hard and it's um you sometimes you don't know unless you it's someone you've worked with before you don't know if how many revisions you're going to be doing you don't know how many extra hours of work is going to take to put it in the game. It, it gets really, really complicated, and there's a lot of re- educational resources to try and help with that stuff out there. But um, so yeah, I don't get like I get royalties for like the plays on streaming services, and I do get royalties for like things that have I've written that have aired on television and stuff like that. Because because royalties that that just happens as as when you watch a TV show that has music in it, whoever wrote that music gets a cut. Mm-hmm. for that time you watched that show oh wow that's how that works it doesn't work that way in games when game is sold it's owned but it's different for tv but um yeah but i don't know so there's different ways to get paid and and normally royalties when it comes to game sales aren't really a part of the equation for most composers um so you just try to be smart you know you try to think about how valuable valuable your time is and 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 try to come up with numbers that feel right now, and, what about like the, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but sure. like for the, the music that you sold and the game never came out, like, do you still get paid for that even though they didn't? Or, that or, particular project, yeah. luckily, I was being paid uh, uh, monthly for the work that I was doing mm-hmm. as that game was being worked on. And when that game got canceled, they don't, you didn't, they wouldn't ask, okay, so you hear about all these studios getting closed or these games getting canceled. Most of those people who worked on the game up to that point were paid. Mm-hmm. So they're not getting paid monthly. And then when the game's canceled, they owe all that money back. It doesn't really work that way. Right. So luckily, I did get paid an amount to make that music. But the game never happened. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, at least I'm not super depressed because I got paid nothing mm-hmm. to, to do music for someone. But it is that music is sort of locked up and will never see the light of day. That's that's lucky that I got paid to do that. Uh, it's way better than just saying you're going to do it and we'll see and then it doesn't happen. So, um Right, but know, it is it wasn't sad yeah. no one will ever hear that music then, right? That's true. Yeah. 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 That's how it is. Kevin's next question is do you work with other musicians when you record for games? Yeah, uh almost always. Sometimes not. I I'll get for me I'll get I'll get other players in, I'll get drummers in or vocalists in or people to play solos or other stuff and then when I'm getting pulled in to play on a soundtrack, obviously I'm playing with them. But it just depends. I, I think it's really hard to. I don't really write AAA music, you know. So I don't. I'm not hiring uh, an orchestra in Prague to record <laughs> my orchestral music, which is where you go, by the way. You go to Prague. Um, I don't. I don't do that. So I don't have to worry about budgeting that. I like to keep it. I, I do mostly indie game music, so I like to kind of keep it where I don't have to hire external musicians to write to play the stuff that I write. I like to try and do it all myself. But I'm always trying to get guests in that do what they do best because it just makes it better. Nice. You know? uh, he's got one more, and I promise this is the the last one from Kevin. He, he said says, he didn't mind Kevin's questions, okay? Just keep <laughs> don't, don't mind. I don't mind Kevin's questions. Yeah. Uh, he said, is there a dream game that you want to perform on? As far as a genre, I think it would be really fun to write a shmup soundtrack. What about a shmup across? Schmuckross. I don't know what you just said. I don't know what either you just said. <laughs> no, it's from our um, renaming game title. Episode. Genres. I forget the Re- name. Renaming the genre, genres. Yeah. We were talking about so you... sh- shoot them up. If you're shooting across, it's a, it's a schmuckross. Oh, schmuckross. Like if it's so if <laughs> yeah. it's like if it's, if it's like life force. Yeah. yeah. If it's life force, it's just schmuckross yes. or greatest. Yeah. Okay. Ten four. So a schmuckross would be pretty cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would love to. And I would love to do a horror game. Oh. And I would love to do, uh, and I would love to do a pinball machine, like a physical, like a real one. Oh, like a real pinball machine. I saw Scott's face light up as yeah. soon as you said pinball. Uh-huh. <laughs> there, there was so, a yeah. guy that I was following on Twitter for a while, and I haven't like seen him in a while. I wonder if it ever happened. That was designing a Metroid pinball table. Like, oh, I'm familiar. Yeah. Um. Yep. I, I think it's in Chicago, actually. Like, it's not maybe Indiana. Um. How cool to be if you got to do the soundtrack on that, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of DIY pinball stuff out there, so who knows? But that is just a, a kind of an all-time. It's very game-related. It's a game adjacent. It's similar. It's music. It's loops. It's sound effects. It's fanfares. It's mm-hmm. all the stuff you hear in a game, but it's just in a... It, it, there's just a giant steel ball flying around, <laughs> smashing your finger. Yeah, I'm also going to need you to call my wife and convince her that it's a good idea to get a physical pinball table in my basement. You know, one of those ones you made... With a with a t- oh the, like a virtual pin yeah yeah oh yeah because I'm not gonna have like 15 pinball tables down here but just get one that I can play any pinball effects game on that just would be amazing I can I can try I can work I, on that I appreciate for it for you that that and an uh, espresso machine espresso machines cheaper <laughs> I know right <laughs> like way cheaper <laughs> well Grant thank you so much for sharing that information about uh, what you do it's a uh, it's a fascinating um endeavor i just i've I've always had been curious about how all that works and um thanks for sharing it's been awesome yeah it's fun to it's fun to talk about and i don't talk about it like this a lot so it's kind of fun to think through sure uh in real time uh we're gonna kind of keep this going though and talk about soundtracks and